Uh, so I'm Zane Selvins. I'm a member of the Catalyst Cooperative, and I'm going to talk a little bit about yeah, workplace democracy and open source projects. So this is our co-op. There's, there's nine of us. Um, we are a co-op. We're a company focused on public interest technology. We started in 2017 uh, to try and make energy data in the U.S. more accessible to activists and researchers and other people that are not like primarily commercially interested and who are working on uh, the energy transition. We began with three members, and yeah, this is the first time we actually all met in person, which was last year. We're all remote and scattered across North America, and we do a mix of data engineering and software engineering um, and really provide infrastructure and data support to uh, organizations. Our main kind of open gig is the Public Utility Data Liberation Project, uh, which is an open source pipeline that takes you know, gigabytes of data from the US government, which is almost impossible to use as it is published and very poorly curated, and then turns it into a kind of a unified database that can be used by people more, more easily if they have kind of basic data skills. So the overall narrative here is, um, first we're gonna look a little bit at some probably familiar organizational models. Um, then I'm gonna explain what a worker co-op is at all and how it differs from more familiar models. And then I'm gonna look at some familiar open source paths and some of the pathologies that many of us are already probably familiar with, how they do or don't work out well. And then I wanna look at how the kind of the merging the worker co-op structure with an open source or open data project structure, you know, maybe there are some positive synergies to be had there. And then, you know, to be sustainable long-term, you need a business plan, you need some kind of economic um, system that will support the work. And I'm not claiming that worker co-ops are some, some kind of magic wand, they're not gonna fix all the problems, it's just a less well-known uh, model which has been working well for us for the last seven years, surprisingly well uh, <laughs> in my book, but it's, it's been great. So most modern economic institutions, you know, including companies, universities, nonprofits, they, they have people that are playing some mix of these three roles. Um, labor, the people that are doing the work, uh, capital, people who are investing and expecting a return on their investment, and then governance is the people who are making the decisions and have control over the organization. And especially in the context of um, digital public goods, you also typically have users who are downstream, people who are consuming the outputs of your work. Um, and for us, you know, there's also overlap with the user. Like we eat our own kind of data outputs and use it in other contexts. But hopefully, most of the users are not internal to the organization. Hopefully, most of them are out there in the world making change with the data. Now, especially in the case of the capital and governance roles, there's also the question of how, how the capital or how the decision-making power is distributed across the different people that are involved. So we've kind of come to expect as normal this kind of $1, one dollar, one vote cap um, capitalism that is typical in especially a publicly traded company, but also many private companies or VC funded companies. Um, but historically, and even today, like it doesn't have to be that way. It's been organized lots of different ways. Um, you may know that uh, Facebook and uh, Google, or Meta and Alphabet, are effectively dictatorships. You know, there's one or two people who have a tiny minority or small minority of the overall economic investment in these companies, but they have more than a majority of the voting power, so they can do whatever they want. <clears throat> and at the other end of the spectrum, you have kind of a traditional non-profit organization in which the ownership role has been purposefully excluded. So there are no investors, there are no owners in the sense that you would have shareholders. Um, although, of course, a nonprofit can generate revenue and you know, net, net income and reinvest it in the mission of the organization. Um, but typically with a nonprofit, you have a board that has all of the governance power, which is usually not the people who are doing the work within the organization. And that can lead to some uncomfortable split incentives where you know, either the board checks out and they really don't know what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis, but they do still have the power and that can create tension or conflict with the staff who are doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be that way, but that is a pathology that exists in many nonprofit organizations, at least that I've been involved in. And, you know, organizing these different roles differently and the distribution of the capital and, you know, governance control, like you just get structurally different institutional outcomes depending on how you compose those different things together. So a worker co-op is also a relatively extreme version of how you might uh, allocate those roles. And in a worker co-op in particular, labor, capital, and governance are all kind of embodied in the same individuals. 
Uh, it's a, a flat democratic organization, so each member, or in this case, each employee, has one vote. Uh, and the profit, if there is any, is allocated not based on how much money you invested in the co-op, but based on how much work you did for the co-op. So typically in proportion to the number of hours that you worked over the course of the year in which the profits were generated. Now this, this structure internalizes a lot of the unavoidable tensions that exist between uh, the workers and the investors and the people with governance power. It doesn't make those tensions go away, but it does mean that you have no choice but to think about the role of an employee and the role of an owner and the role of the person who has to make the decision um, in every board meeting, in every like stand-up meeting, like we are all of those things. Um, which I think makes those problems more transparent and allows you to have more productive conversations around them. This flat governance structure also really discourages concentrated investment. So, you know, if you don't get additional power or additional uh, investment returns by investing more money, that's a pretty big incentive not to invest more money. So, some businesses, like if you're trying to build a $10 billion chip fab or a $1 billion battery factory, like probably not going to do it with a co-op. But luckily, in the context of digital public goods, it's not very capital intensive. You know, you need a laptop, you need some skills, you need some people who care about the, the issue that you're trying to address, and the main input is really just your, your time and, and knowledge. So in the case of Catalyst, you know, we are the employees, we are the shareholders, we are the board of directors, um, and we're also, you know, some slice of the end users. So th what this means in practice is that we set our own salaries, um, and we have complete salary transparency. Um, we do a monthly financial check-in. Everybody knows whether we are about to go bankrupt or are you know, making bank this year. So there's no surprise firing when it turns out there's no money left in the bank. Um, you know, we've decided that nobody needs to work more than half time if they don't want to. Um, we've decided that people can take up to six months leave of absence if they want to, to you know, do something that's not data engineering, heaven forbid. Um, you know, and we decide if and when to distribute the, the surplus, the profits, um, if we have them. And we're meeting up next week in Mexico City for our second annual um, retreat to do some strategic planning. And it's, it's, it's a very interesting experience to play all of these roles simultaneously and kind of juggle them in your brain. So switching gears now to talk about open source projects, which I suspect people are maybe more familiar with. You know, a lot of open source projects start as an individual passion project, scratching some itch that you have and can't find a tool or project to, that already does. You know, sometimes that turns into a dictatorship, you know, benevolent or not. Um, it may be kind of an informal duocracy where, you know, whoever puts in the most effort ends up having de facto more control. You know, that pattern can sometimes be subverted by paid corporate contributors who you know, are being paid full time maybe to work on the project. So even if there is some other governance structure for the project, um, if, if like in reality most of the hours and effort and pull requests coming into the project are from these paid out, outside developers, they will have a lot of control. Um, there's these kind of deus ex machina giant corporate projects like Airflow or TensorFlow um, where it was developed internally and then came into the world as an open source project that like is, is great, you know, they're great resources. Are they sustainable in a community context? Sometimes, mm, sometimes maybe not. And then in the last few years, there's been kind of a wave of explicitly, you know, open VC or venture capital funded projects, like from the get-go, like we're gonna make an open thing and sell some kind of SaaS service on top of it or have some open core, whatever. Um, and we rely on one of these DAX or the orchestration framework that we use for our data pipeline. And I think it's an open question, what happens when the, the capitalists come for their profits? You know, five years, 10 years down the line, will it remain open? Will it continue to serve uh, community needs? Unclear, we'll see. Um, there are also happy endings. You know, if it's a giant project that serves millions of people like Python, you know, you can capture just a tiny fraction of the overall value and still end up with enough to run a foundation, hire a few core developers. Um, but I think especially for smaller, kind of narrow, more narrowly focused projects, we need other models um, besides capturing like one-tenth of one percent or one-one-hundredth of one percent of the value to make sure that they are economically uh, viable. So why would you want to choose a worker co-op to you know, govern and operate your project? Um, it really, like I said, reduces the split incentives by internalizing all the stakeholder groups into you know, one group of people. It 
in particular, maximizes organizational autonomy. You know, like obviously you do still have to pay everybody salaries, um, but you don't have an external board, you don't have external investors. You, you know, up to you to sink or swim and, and make it work. There's, there's no other boss to call in. Um, it also, because of the flat investment strategy or investment landscape, it reduces concentrated incentives to liquidate and extract capital. Like we all have one share, we all work approximately the same number of hours. Nobody's going to be able to extract, you know, outsized returns and have like a, a good reason to fight very hard for that. Um, practicing democratic governance for the organization from day one sets you up well to like develop those skills and potentially deploy them in a broader e open source ecosystem if and when the project gets to the point where you need to have a, a bigger governance structure. Um, and honestly, jobs with real purpose and autonomy, like where you really do have the power to do whatever you want, um, for better or for worse, those are pretty rare. Um, and that has been hugely helpful for us in recruiting like qualified people who are like, yeah, I want to work from every, from anywhere on earth, you know, half time and make like an okay salary and work on something that doesn't feel evil. There are people that are up for that job, which is great. Um, and of course, it does create a container, an economic container in which you can potentially, you know, do long-term economic planning and um, pay the core maintainers if you can capture enough of the value um, to do that. So what kinds of projects might have a business hiding inside of them that this could work for? So I think a narrow user base with a deep need is one um, thing to look for. You have high user commitment. Users that are actually deriving some economic benefit from the project, so they would, in other, um, you know, else being equal, they would need to pay for the data or pay for a tool, and the open project is providing that. Um, it serves some broader public interest, you know, which opens up grant funding opportunities. Um, and if for some reason the users need or value openness, you know, that will allow you to plow work that you're doing um, for the users or in collaboration with the users or your clients back into the open project. Um, but ultimately, as some co-op or the, the co-op developer who helped us incorporate said, like, if there is no margin, there is no mission. Like, you, you have to have some kind of ongoing economic, um, you know, value generation to keep things running. So, just really quickly, I'm going to go through a few of the business models that we have either made use of or are hoping to make use of going forward. You know, the obvious one, grant funding. Ask a billionaire to give you $100,000. Um, that's five minutes until questions start. OK, great. Um, you know, so we've, we've been lucky to have support from the Sloan Foundation, Dead Billionaire, or uh, the Eric Schmidt uh, Futures Fund via Climate Change II. That's live billionaire money. Um, we're waiting desperately to hear back from NSF on a big, um, their Pathways to Open Source Ecosystems uh, grant program, which is amazing. If you're in the US and could possibly get an NSF grant, you should definitely look at it. it it's, I'm amazed that it exists. Um, the big opportunity with grants is like, this is basically a seed round investor who does not want voting control and does not expect any return of or return on their capital, which is incredible. So if, if you're trying to create digital public goods and there's a grantor who has aligned interests, go crazy. Like, it, it's, it's, it's great. Challenges, of course, they don't want to do this forever, so you have like a limited runway to get to where you have some other kind of economy supporting you. Um, also, grant funders are not users. And in, in particular, the private foundation <laughs> grants, they have really limited oversight, like a shocking, shockingly small amount of oversight in, in my experience. So you're not going to get concrete user feedback from them. They're not, they're not users. Um, and you know, if depending on the foundation uh, or the granting agency, you may need to have a nonprofit sponsor who is tax deductible to be able to accept that money. Consulting, another obvious option. Um, so, you know, even if the tool or the data set that you're developing is truly open, you will still have a big advantage over anybody else because you developed it, you understand the details and the kind of quirks of it, um, and so you can still potentially build a consulting business on top of that tool or that data um, while still, you know, allowing others to use it. Consulting, you know, in our experience, has provided a lot of opportunities to kind of learn things around the periphery of our, our knowledge. So. Like we did uh, one client project to parse uh, air pollution data out of um, natural gas kind of well information for understanding public health impacts. And that gave us the opportunity to learn how to do document modeling and extract structured data from PDFs, of which there are many millions of pages in the US energy regulatory system. So that's something that we're now um, working on with that Mozilla Foundation grant to pull out utility ownership data from um, SEC filings. Um, many clients will be very demanding users, and they will give very rapid and intense feedback about what is working and what is not working, which is ultimately 
necessary to like make a good output, whether it's software or data. Um, you don't want to end up just kind of making something in a vacuum that doesn't serve anybody's actual needs. Uh, yeah, challenges. You know, if you have, we have found, like, if, if you have consulting projects internally that don't actually feed into or depend on the open underlying infrastructure that you're building, you can create internal divisions within the organization where there are different interests, like, I'm working on the client project that brings in the money. You're working on the open source project, which is way less stressful, and also, like, doesn't bring in any money. Like, why are we doing this? And you, you want to avoid that kind of rift. So keeping the two really, you know, intimately connected with each other somehow is important. Um, and then, you know, you do need revenue, so it can be difficult when you want to be choosy about the projects, but if you need income, like, you may have to take projects that don't align with your values, that don't really rely on the underlying project. Um, this, we're looking at developing right now. So we've historically been very lucky to have RMI, uh, the formerly the Rocky Mountain, Rocky Mountain Institute, an NGO in the US, as a, as a client. Um, and they've paid for a lot of ongoing data updates over time. Um, but they're kind of tired of that, understandably, and um, are, at, are pushing us to kind of like, are there maybe some other organizations that would be willing to chip in for the annual updates? Um, so we're, we're trying to come up with a consortium of like 10, 15, 20 different organizations that can each pitch in like $10,000 a year or something to do the ongoing maintenance that's necessary to keep the data fresh um, and, you know, implement improvements over time. <clears throat> uh, yeah, almost done. So yeah, the obvious challenge here is, you know, free riders, if they can get it for free, why would anybody chip in? Um, but I think, you know, these, these are people who need to have enlightened self-interest, but they are typically mission-oriented NGOs in our case, so I think there's a good, a good case for this working. Um, and we're excited to try it out. And then, you know, there's the kind of more classical freemium or tiered access and software as a service platforms, which, you know, you, you can do, but it is a step down the path towards not being open. And, you know, especially you know, once you've built the infrastructure to, you know, provide differential access, I think it will be very tempting to potentially start extracting value um, th through that and more and more value incrementally over time. So we're very apprehensive about, you know, this potential path. But that is the end of the talk. Here are some, you know, links to us and some resources that are interesting if you want to know more about these things. But Thanks for coming. Thanks so much, Zane. All right, we have probably a very quick one or two questions. Thank you. How is the wealth distribution managed in your co-op? Like, is it like by amount of work? Is it equal for everyone? How does it work? Wealth distribution, like the income of the company? Uh, thus far, we have chosen to kind of pay ourselves on an hourly basis, and we still, you know, even seven years in, we all make the same hourly wage. And if there are profits to distribute, it's in proportion to the number of hours that each person has worked in the year. All right, one question, quickly. Um, one of the common issues for nonprofit or mission-driven organizations is that employees tend to take a lot of ownership and become overloaded uh, with workload. So how do you address that challenge in a cooperative? I think this problem exists in any kind of mission-oriented organization, probably regardless of the structure. and. I mean, part, part of how we're trying to mitigate this is by saying you don't have to work more than half time. Like, if everybody wants to work half time, then we probably need to hire more people, and that's fine. Um, and, you know, having a liberal time off policy that's like, if you want to take a leave of absence, do something else, that's also fine. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it is, it's still a challenge. And we're, you know, especially Christine and I, the founders, <laughs> struggle with this.